Hello, and welcome back to Radiography Simplified. I am Michael. We pick up where we left off on radiobiology. In this video, we discuss cell biology. I understand that it's probably been a while since you had a biology lecture on cells. I mean, for me, I haven't had a lecture on this topic in, uh, 10 years. You've probably gone a similar length of time without having to learn all these stuff, and maybe you've forgotten a few concepts here and there. Not to worry, we'll save you a trip to the library by going through the key concepts over the next couple of minutes. So let's kick it off, shall we? By definition, a cell is the basic structural unit of all organisms. All cells come from pre-existing cells. These are statements extracted from the cell theory, which is a mid-19th century scientific theory that was postulated by a German botanist named Matthias Schleiden and a physician, Theodor Schwann, also from Germany. The cell theory was once universally accepted. But as of today, some biologists consider non-cellular entities like viruses to be living organisms, thus disproving the cell theory. Well, this isn't a problem for us, as concepts of the cell theory are still very relevant to our study of radiation biology. With that being said, let's dive into the concepts of the cell theory. The first postulate of the cell theory states that all living things are made of cells. Next, it states that all cells are produced from pre-existing cells, referring to processes such as mitosis and meiosis. In number three, we have the cell being referred to as the fundamental unit of an organism, a phyu. Postulate number four states that the activity of an organism depends on the activity of its cells. This simply means that any process that the body is going through is actually happening because of a group of cells that are facilitating said process. Take, for example, digestion. When your body digests food, various cells of your digestive tract play various roles that contribute to the general process of digestion. This helps us to think of the human body as a huge factory with the tens of trillions of cells acting as different pieces of equipment in our factory. Postulate 5 tells us that energy flows within these cells. And Postulate 6 states that these cells contain genetic material. This genetic material refers to substances such as DNA in the chromosomes and RNA in the nucleus and cytoplasm. We'll talk about DNA and RNA later in this video. Lastly, point number seven tells us that cells are of the same chemical composition in organisms of similar species. We've spent the last couple of minutes talking about the cell theory. Now, I'd have you know that there would not be a cell theory if Robert Hooke did not discover cells in the first place. You see, many decades before the cell theory was formed, Robert Hooke invented the light microscope which aided the discovery of cells. Down the line, we came to realize that living organisms can be classified based on the number of cells that they possess into unicellular and multicellular organisms. For example, the human body is estimated to have 30 trillion cells. So if you're listening to this, you're a multicellular organism. Now, why don't you put some of those cells of your fingers to good use by hitting that like button? If you're done with that, let us roll. Another way to classify cells is by whether or not they possess a nucleus. Prokaryotes are less complicated cells, such as bacteria cells. Eukaryotes, on the other hand, are more sophisticated cells, such as cells of the human body. There are very key differences between these two cell types, the first being that the prokaryotes do not have a nucleus while eukaryotes possess a nucleus. As you'll learn soon enough, the nucleus houses the genetic material called DNA. Prokaryotic cells like bacteria don't have a nucleus, so their genetic material just floats around within the cell's cytoplasm. In addition to not having a nucleus, prokaryotic cells also lack an internal membrane. All they have is an external membrane. Eukaryotes have both an internal and external membrane. Think of the internal membrane as the walls inside your house that help to separate the living room from the bedroom and the bedroom from the bathroom. What I'm saying, in essence, is that the internal membrane helps to compartmentalize different metabolic activities. What makes the eukaryotic cell to be so complicated is that it allows multiple biochemical and metabolic processes to be going on at the same time within the cell. The internal membrane separates the areas in which these activities are going on, preventing them from being a nuisance to each other. The lack of an internal membrane will sort of affect the number of metabolic activities that can go on at the same time in a prokaryotic cell. 
reminding us once again why it is a very non-complicated cell. The last difference that we'd be talking about is the lack of a cytoskeleton in a prokaryote. Just like your skeleton provides support to your body, the cytoskeleton provides support to the eukaryotic cell. The prokaryotic cell is a very simple cell that does not need or have a cytoskeleton. On the subject matter of radiation biology, we are more interested in the eukaryotic cells, as the human body is made of eukaryotic cells. In that regard, we'd be going over the different parts or organelles of the eukaryotic cells. First off, we have the cytoplasm. The cytoplasm is a gelatinous solution found between the plasma membrane and nucleus of the cell. This solution contains inorganic ions which serve as the building blocks of many metabolic processes that go on within the cell. The cytoplasm has at some point been colloquially referred to as the gas station of the cell, and here's why. Let's say another organelle within the cell runs out of a particular ion which it uses to carry out a certain metabolic process. There would not be a problem because the cytoplasm in most cases would simply provide a refill of those ions to the organelle in need. In addition to supplying ions to the other organelles, the cytoplasm also serves as the medium within which the other organelles float. Next up, the nucleus. This is the most complicated organelle found in mammalian cells. But to keep things simple, we won't be going over all the intricate details. Remember, this is a radiobiology course, and we are only zipping through cell biology as a preamble to the discussions on radiobiology that we will have going forward. So don't expect too many details on cell biology. With that being said, what's the key stuff we need to know about the nucleus? First, the nucleus contains the genetic material of the cell, deoxyribonucleic acid, commonly known as DNA. This makes the nucleus the control center of the cell. The nucleus also contains structures that make it possible to perform important cellular activities such as DNA replication and RNA transcription. Now, the ribosomes. There are two types of ribosomes found in a eukaryotic cell, free and bound. The free ribosomes just float around on their own within the cell. As for the bound ribosomes, they are attached to another set of organelles called the endoplasmic reticulum, which we will talk about next. Ribosomes are the protein factory of the cell. Here's how it works. The nucleus sends a sequence of mRNA to the, the ribosomes. This mRNA sequence serves as blueprints which the ribosomes use to synthesize or form proteins within the cell. Now we have the endoplasmic reticulum. The endoplasmic reticula are membrane-lined channels that stretch from the nucleus to the cell surface. They have three regions based on the presence of ribosomes. We just mentioned that bound ribosomes are attached to the endoplasmic reticulum. The regions of the endoplasmic reticulum that are attached to ribosomes are called rough endoplasmic reticulum. Remember, ribosomes are responsible for protein synthesis, so it only makes sense that the part of the endoplasmic reticulum that contains ribosomes would also be involved in protein synthesis. Thus, the primary function of the rough endoplasmic reticulum is the synthesis and folding of proteins. As for the transitional endoplasmic reticulum, it lies between the rough and smooth endoplasmic reticulum. And what it does is it receives the proteins that were scythesized and folded in the rough endoplasmic reticulum. The transitional endoplasmic reticulum then goes on to create packages called vesicles, in which the folded proteins are transported to where they are needed. Think of the transitional endoplasmic reticulum as a delivery company. Let's move on to the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Now, what if I told you that the smooth endoplasmic reticulum is actually responsible for smoothie production? <laughs> That's a joke. I just wanted to make sure you're still following all of this. The smooth endoplasmic reticulum lacks ribosomes and is actually involved in the breakdown or metabolism of drugs, synthesis of steroids, and storage of calcium. Next up, we have the Golgi apparatus. Most of the proteins leaving the endoplasmic reticulum are first transported to the Golgi apparatus. At this point, I'd like you to take a moment to notice how we've managed to connect everything so far. 
from the nucleus giving instructions to the ribosomes using these instructions to produce proteins, to the endoplasmic reticulum packaging that produce proteins, and now to the Golgi apparatus that receives these proteins. In the Golgi apparatus, the proteins are modified into a form where they are more usable by the cell. When the protein has been modified, the apparatus repackages and sends the protein into the cytoplasm for usage. Next, the mitochondrion. The cell needs energy to function. This energy is produced in the mitochondrion through processes such as oxidative phosphorylation. Now the lysosomes, the real trash masters. Every organized unit needs a garbage disposal system. The lysosomes contain special digestive enzymes that break down DNA, proteins, and carbs. It is very useful in the process of programmed cell death, known as apoptosis. Next is the DNA, the genetic material which we have mentioned at various points in this video. DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid, and it contains the biological information of an organism. Information about you, such as your hair or eye color, is encoded into your DNA, making it unique to each individual. Another form of genetic material is the ribonucleic acid, which is responsible for transporting information, a type of RNA called messenger RNA, or mRNA, carries information from the DNA to the ribosomes. It is based on this information that the ribosomes synthesize proteins. That concludes our discussion on the cell theory and genetic apparatus. Next up, we discuss the types of radiation. Stay tuned and don't forget to subscribe.